Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I am your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I am joined by Beth Hammond to talk about practice pads. Beth, welcome to the show. Hi, Bart. Thanks so much for having me here. Absolutely. So um, you are like on social media, on Facebook, on the practice pad page, you are just so knowledgeable and passionate about practice pads. I just had to have you on the show to cover this uh, <laughs> seemingly on the surface. It's sort of like one of those topics that people might go, well, well, you know, whatever. But I know there's much, much, much more to it. And uh, it's got a rich, a rich history. But before we start, what got you so into practice pads? Well, two things. First of all, I grew up uh, in a series of apartments until I moved into our first house at age 12. And so living in apartments, you develop a style of walking that my sister and I call apartment feet. <laughs> you have to be conscious of the neighbors below. Yes. If you live below people, you have to be careful that the sounds you make don't travel up. Uh-huh. So you have to be apartment sensitive. And I didn't get my first real drum until I was 15. Hmm. Um So in order for me to learn how to play the drums, I had to play everything exclusively on a practice pad. And so they're kind of near and dear to my heart. When I rekindled my interest in drums and drumming about 10 years ago, um, after, after establishing a career as a cantorial soloist in synagogues, um, I decided, you know, I I was getting all these emails from friends. Oh, are you into vintage drums? No, I'm not into vintage drums. Who can afford that? I can't (laughs) afford that. Where would I put them all? You you see these things on Facebook, these guys on the vintage drum networks that have like entire wings of their houses devoted to storing vintage drums. And I went, that's not my life. But I did notice two things. Nobody was really into collecting practice pads Mm -hmm. or was talking about it. And nobody was really into researching the history. And so I decided that it it just spoke to me. And I said, practice pads. I love my practice pads. And by then I had already been collecting for like 20 years. And so I had a number of practice pads and I decided to make that a hobby focus. Uh, About four or five years ago, I started really getting into it. I also enjoy research. I like to look things up and go down rabbit holes and read strange tangential wings of topics that Mm. seemingly don't connect. But if you keep going down the columns and you keep reading, you discover, oh my gosh, there's a connection here. And so that, all of that led to me going practice pads. I love practice pads. I'm currently surrounded in my studio by about 150 practice pads. Oh my gosh. Wow. But they all, but they all fit on shelves and in one room and my vintage drum collecting buddies can't do that. They can't match that. No, it's there's parallels to that to some of the guys I've had on who've talked about uh, collecting um, vintage pedals. Where oh my gosh, much more attainable, much smaller, and they um, they they basically said that it's it's a similar thing where it's cheaper. You know, you can get them for fifty bucks. Well, it is. I mean, and most people don't dig practice pads the way I do. So sometimes I luck out and I find something really interesting and different and. You know, there aren't a lot of them around either because it's a really old homemade pad from the 20s or it's a one off that some teacher designed and his student made um, that you're not going to see those mass produced. But boy, they're interesting. And so I go, I want to try and acquire that so I can look at it up close and study it and really understand it. Just just as an aside, I was also a professional bicycle mechanic and bike shop co-owner for 20 years. So I've always had an interest and how things are made, and how things work. So you're a very mechanically inclined person to begin with. and I am. uh, Obviously very intelligent, but also you just have that part of your brain where you want to learn more, and you want to push more. And I'm fascinated by how stuff can be made into other stuff. And that's a lifelong obsession of mine. I started by taking apart a a wind-up desk clock when I was six. And by the time I was 12, I had carefully taken my mom's stitch ripper to dismantle a shirt so I could see how it was made. Huh. Nobody had told me yet about patterns. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've always been curious that way. Yeah, and it's it's clearly paid off. Um, and it's it's good to be curious. Uh, and and practice pads are 
Uh, like I said, they're seemingly, um, you know, what's the big difference? But as I think we're about to find out from you throughout time, there are a lot of differences. Um, and I will, I posted a question on uh, drumforum.org. I mean, I yes. think I posted it there September 16th, 2020, which almost a year ago. And, and um, it takes a while to find the right people. And then you, I kind of like, uh, I was sort of watching your page and stuff, and I was like, okay, you are definitely the right person here. Um, <laughs> so uh, I have some cool little like pictures from there that I'm going to share on social media later, and you yeah. shared some pictures with me that I'll post on social media. But Right. One of the pictures you shared at Drum Forum yeah. was of a practice pad that I wound up becoming the owner of. Oh, really? And that was the white practice pad with the rubber spot atop a clear plexiglass uh uh, angle. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I call, I call it the deco pad. I <laughs> actually awesome. wound up buying that pad from the previous owner. Wow. And I went down some crazy rabbit holes doing research about why did this pad get made and who made it and what was their background and, and what happened to the business of selling these pads after he started making them. And it's, it's on my drum blog. Uh, I have a blog called drum love on Blogspot. Cool. One word, drum love. There's topics there under the deco pad. Awesome. So you can find all the history that I dug up on this one pad. But I love doing that kind of research. It's fascinating. Yeah, it's very re rewarding. Um, and and I'll go through all of them later, but I believe the his username or her name was Stop Sign 70 I think, who mm -hmm. posted that original one. But I'll, I'll go through just because everyone posted a lot of cool pictures and just give yeah, them a yeah. shout out. But um, anyway, to jump into the topic here, Let's start at the beginning mm -hmm. and learn about the history of practice pads. Where does it all begin as far as we can tell, you know? The only evidence that we have as far as anything prior to commercially made mass produced pads is anecdotal. It's somebody writing in a journal or it's somebody telling somebody about what they used and sure. The earliest references in that sort of vein that I was able to find date back to the 1880s. Uh, somebody was interviewing a theater drummer of the day, and he was warming up uh, by playing his sticks on the leather padded center cushioned part of a wooden dining room chair. Yep. And that was his practice pad. Um, they, you know... People used stacked pieces of cardboard boxes. Yep. People stretched leather around a piece of wood and tacked it in place. Or if they had it, they would take an old calfskin head that didn't serve anymore, cut it into a smaller size, add a little stuffing like, you know, wool from a sheep or something, and they'd stuff that under there. And then they'd stretch it as far as they could and tack that into place with tacks and a hammer. Hmm. And all of those things became practice pads. Um, my first practice pad on the road wasn't even my Remo tunable pad, which dates me. I started playing drums. I started playing dr uh, drums with sticks in 1973 when I was 10. And my pad, the, the standard issue in those days was the little gray Remo practice pad that was tunable. You could replace the head. Sure. But on the road, when I toured one season with a drum corps, I didn't have room in my bag to bring my practice pad. And, and everybody said, that's okay. They make us practice on pillows. Bring a pillow. And, we all, and at night, we'd lay out our sleeping bags in the gym, and we'd practice our show on pillows with no rebound, which meant your hands and wrists got really strong because they really got a workout. Um, from that, from, from base, I mean... We talked earlier about me having a mechanical bent. If you think about what American life was like between 1890 and, say, 1920, most people knew how to fix their stuff they owned. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, you know, America was still a semi-rural country that was rapidly industrializing. You had a lot of people out there that knew, uh, that knew rudimental, rudimentary machinery. They knew some, some carpentry. They knew how to make stuff. They knew how to fix the things they owned. It was a very different time mm -hmm. from the way we live now. And so practice pad, and I put this in quotes, practice pad innovations 
were one-offs. They were one at a time as the individual found something that they needed or figured out that they could use. Sure. And so you don't really see any standardization of this until we get into the 20s. Hmm. Um, the very first U.S. patent awarded for a practice pad device was awarded to uh, a man named, I believe, Henry Bauer. I could, it could be Harry Bauer. Sure. I wasn't able to find it. But, but Mr. Bauer submitted a sketch and a description for a patent on a drum practice device in 1919. I believe the patent was awarded in 1920. By 1921, his, his pad had been licensed. He had licensed the manufacturer, the, quote, mass production of mm. his pad to a fellow in Los Angeles who ran a music store and he licensed this fellow to mass produce his pads. Wow. Now, when I say mass produce, I'm saying it with my tongue in my cheek, really, because mass producing at that, uh, for, for the population of that time, mass producing meant you probably made a couple of hundred of these. Yeah, by hand. At most. Yeah. And you sent them out to people. Yeah. So what we have, and I sent you pictures of it. Yep. What we have is, is a, a, a platform of wood. Um, carved, uh, cut into a round shape, and then holes were drilled so that you could then lay a piece of tanned leather over the top, with also with holes drilled to line up, and you you took literally a shoelace and you tied these two things together. Most people, you know, or Bauer's design took a thin piece of boiled wool. Hmm. Maybe maybe no more than an eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch thick, and slid it between the leather and the wood. You took the shoelace, you tied all of that together, you tightened it as much as you could, and suddenly you had a practice pad, and it was actually pretty functional for the day. Yeah, and and honestly, looking at it though, I like it because there's certain pads like um, like I had Jason on from Pro Logics, and I know they have pads mm, where you yeah. can switch the top out and get different you know, feels. And I honestly see this, the Bauer pad as being similar to where you could probably change out your material. You could change, you know, oh, it's worn out. Let me, f let me put a different um, piece of leather or piece of calfskin or whatever on there. Right. Pretty right. Cool that it's interchangeable. I like that. It is interchangeable though. I don't, I don't see any evidence in the limited documentation that indicates Bauer was thinking that far ahead. Hmm, gotcha. Um, yeah. You know, I think it's a great idea. I'm certainly curious now. It's like, oh, I got to make another one of these. I made a functional replica based on Bauer's sketch that was submitted for patent. Yeah. Um, and because I'm the kind of person that likes to make stuff out of stuff, mine is pretty crude. Um, I don't have a lot of fancy woodworking tools where I live. But I was able to get an approximation of... A very functional pad, and it works. It's sure. It looks, it's great. Looks great. Yeah. There, there you go. go. It sounds good, and I love how it says directions because you have on the back. I'm assuming this is like the original price that you've you've printed and put on the back. I like how it says directions. Place upon a sofa pillow, incline slightly <laughs> to allow left stick perfect action. It's, it's well, just, you remember everybody played traditional grip in those days. Yes, which I think we'll get to soon with the the practice pads that are more uh, lifted, yeah. which obviously yeah. we'll, we'll get there. But um, it's pretty cool. And but I I think it needs to be said that talking about practice pads and drums in general, and like you said, where you're just playing, you know, your your instructor or whatever said play on a um, a pillow. Yeah. It, 1880s as the first kind of formal practice pad. It makes me think, though, that guys and girls had to be just literally playing on their knee or their bed or their pillow, of course, or their you know, uh, in their cave. I mean, for I'm looking for a flat surface that I can strike with a stick. Yeah, for as okay. Long as the ground works. Yeah, the ground. If the ground is flat, look. Let's use that. Yeah. Um, I. I'm not going to dispute it. I, I would say that, you know, before we had a sense of industrialization of drumming and drums, people made do with whatever they could cobble together. Sure. In a pre-industrialized America, in a pre-industrialized Europe even. I mean, I, 
Now, now understand that most of my research is about practice pads in America because that's the easiest information for me to find through research. Yeah, I'm glad you said that. There's a wonderful website that you can look up called Google Patents, yeah. and you can use that to locate patents on innovations in almost any field, including drum practice pads. Sure. Yeah. Good. I'm glad we kind of clarified that because, because of course, we're talking about, you know, more m- quote unquote modernized practice pads, not in like, you know, um, the year 1200 or something. We're, no, we're- no, 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 no. This, this Bauer's, Bauer's design was patented in 1920. Absolutely. So that's the first recorded patent awarded specifically for a drum practice pad. And everything just kind of walks forward from there. Yes. And it's going to be based partly the part, partly the history of commercially made practice pads will over time is going to be based on scientific innovations that were happening independent of drums and percussion. Hmm. So you have some kind of a calf skin stretched over an opening or stretched over stuffing. And we see that from probably the 1890s, maybe earlier, but I can't find documentation well into the 1920s and early 30s. And sometime in the early early 30s, we start to see rubber being used Mm. in various grades and blends in compounds. Um, Gum rubber that is pure gum rubber is very soft. And the earliest gum rubber surfaces for pads are are soft almost to the point of becoming very tacky when they're new. Once they figured out what they could mix with the gum rubber to create a compound that was more durable, but still provided a rebound, you started to see different kinds of rubber in various grades and compounds. In the mid to late 30s, you really started to see more of that. By the time we are getting ready uh, to enter the Second World War, rubber production had ramped up to meet the needs of the military and to meet the needs of industries that were all helping the war effort. And so we start to see a a real influx of rubber covered practice pads in the early 1940s. Mm. Um, And again, the rebound and how well the rubber ages over decades is really, is really a a set of variables. Um, I have a rubber pad that's probably from around 1940. It's labeled the globe. And I'm assuming that was the company that made the pad. This pad is really worn. It's been loved. It's been used. The rubber is still fantastic. And I still like to take this pad out and play it once in a while wow. because the rubber is in such great shape, which tells me it's not pure gum rubber. Hmm. It's been a, something is a little something has been added to it. Because just to gum give it rubber more, would have deteriorated or. Gum rubber would have either been soft, tacky, melted in extreme heat. Sure. Or it would have hardened over time. Gotcha. I have a couple of gum, a, a couple of rubber pads, rubber topped pads, where the rubber has de- degraded to the point where it's a little hard, and it's almost like playing the purposefully hard surface of a modern marching specific pad. Hmm. Not a lot of fun to play, but I have it because it serves. It fills a historical hole in my collection. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So all through the '40s and into the '50s, you see a lot of rubber topped practice pads. This is also when you really begin to see the tilt, Mm. the, the, the tilt to accommodate traditional grip. A lot of those pads are happening in the forties and forward. Um, and, and, and really from, from, I would say roughly late thirties, early forties, all the way into the eighties, you are seeing practice pads with a built-in tilt. Yeah. Either they've been on a built-up wooden platform or they're rubber mounted on a solid wooden wedge mm-hmm. the way that Premier made their pads in the 60s and 70s. Um, and that was because back in, the, back in the 40s and 50s, hardly anybody was playing matched grip, even at a drum kit. Most drummers of that period were still playing traditional grip because the first thing you learned were your rudiments. Why did you learn rudiments? So you could march in your local band or drum corps. How did you do that? You wore your drum on a sling. So there was a natural tilt to the head. Yeah, and I, I, there's some great pictures here on the uh, post in Drum Forum where, I, again, I'll share these pictures, but uh, mm-hmm. stop sign 70 uh, username uh, shared mm-hmm. where you can tilt 
or untilt. It's kind of on a rise as opposed to yes. a wedged block. Um, so as we're going here, I, I, it's obvious that like after 1920, I'm assuming pretty quickly that the big drum companies started to adopt these and put them in their own catalogs because it yes. seems like it became just part of the drumming uh, culture to have a practice pad and to work on it. Why not capitalize on it and put a brand name on it? Well, and, and really practice pads that didn't really innovate were still included in catalogs, especially starting in the mid to late twenties as a way of just further getting the brand name out there. Sure. Um, there's a, but if I, I have a, I have a copy of a 19, what is it? I have a copy of a 1911 Ludwig catalog. It's like eight pages. It's little, it's bitty. Mm -hmm. And there's a practice pad in there that is basically, it looks like somebody took a giant embroidery hoop, stretched a skin over it and stuffed it with batting yeah. and said, here's a practice pad. Wow. Okay. And you're selling this mass produced. Well, they're selling it mass produced for 35 cents, which probably went a lot further in 1911 than it does today. Um, but what you really see is that once we get into the wooden tilted platform era of pads in the 40s and 50s, the differences between pads in terms of their feel aren't that great. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, yeah, there are some... There are some really beautiful pads from this era. One of my one of my favorite pads in my collection dates from about 1948 to 1950. It is a Slingerland Radio King practice pad, mm. and it has a Radio King cloud badge specifically nice. made for the pad. Wow! There's no hole in the middle. Huh? It doesn't go around a sound hole. That's so they awesome. made a specific cloud badge just for that pad. And they only produced that pad from like 1947 until about 1952. Hmm. It was a very short run. And I was lucky enough to score one of these. I got to tell you, the rubber is not so exciting. It's just basic black rubber that's been tacked to a, a, a wooden platform. The cool thing about this is it's a slightly larger pad than you normally see. And it's on a stand. Okay. Mm. It's neat to see that that uh, sort of development because a lot of these, I guess, would have like a uh, whatever the threading would be. I don't know the exact size, quarter thread or whatever, like to fit onto a either a cymbal stand or um, I guess that probably came in later, though, once the threading became more universal. In this period, there were stands that looked like cymbal stands. But they were really designed to take hardware specifically that was nailed or bolted to the underside of a wooden pad. And it didn't depend on threading. Hmm. Interesting. You had, yeah. So um, if you look in catalogs from like 1945 up through the 60s, you'll see this hardware. Um, and, and you can have the option of having this, you know, practice pad X can either have rubber feet on the bottom uh huh. Yeah. For for use on a tabletop or on a music stand, which is how I was taught to first use them. Sure. Or they come with hardware that will let you mount them to a specific stand for that pad, and you can find these stands sometimes online on auction sites and for sale sites. But without the hardware that attaches it to the pad, it's not terribly useful. Hmm. So sure. Um. So so. Some really, uh, some really interesting stuff started to happen. You know, you had this, you had kind of mild variances of size and look and how well the wood was finished and whether the labels were metal or decals. They were mostly decals because they were cheaper to make. Yeah. And we don't really see any more extreme innovation until the late 50s. And we owe that to Remo Belli. Um. In 1957, the first of two revolutionary moments happened that directly affected practice pads later on. The first was that in 1957, Remo Belli filed a patent for the first synthetic drum head, which was made of a new space age material called mylar. And that patent went through revisions and hearings, and it was subsequently approved and awarded in 1960. In 1962, the Remo Drum Company 
put out on the market the first tunable practice pad. You could tune it. I believe the earliest versions could be tuned with a screwdriver. Hmm. They were originally made of a fiber, a fibrous wood, pre- compressed wood fiber platform over which was mounted a metal framework that allowed you to have a tunable mylar head. It felt just like playing a regular drum. It could be tuned just like playing a regular drum. And for that time, it was, the, it was a massively bold innovation. And suddenly everybody went, oh my gosh, I have to have one of these pads. They're insane. I got to have one. I got to have, I've got to have a drum kit made of these pads. And so you see, you see a practice pad drum kit made up of all these first early tunable Remo pads. And it's phenomenal. People go, drummers go nuts. Schools go crazy for this thing because suddenly they don't have to budget having a whole drum set in the band room. And it's nice and quiet and you're not getting, you know, you don't need to just annoy everyone down the hall. That's right. It's quieter <laughs> than a drum kit. Yeah. You don't have to go sit in a soundproof room. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, I have a few examples in my collection of these earliest tunable Remo pads. I also have in my collection the pads that predate them, hmm. which are made of a very lightweight wood and have a pre-stretched, pre-tuned mylar plastic head. Uh, I think they attempted to fill the space between the head and the platform with some kind of foam rubber that really disintegrated over time because now yeah. I have one of these things and it's foam rubber crumbs oh, man. crawling, <laughs> floating around inside. But I have, here's another, uh, here's another resource that you could go and check out. That's a really fun rabbit hole for drummers of all ages. Remo drums, uh, Remo percussion has a timeline, a historic timeline from the beginning of their first developments to their establishment as a company all, I, t- I think it takes you all the way up into the early 2000s. Hmm. Very cool. And, and you can see, if you look closely enough, you can see the changes in the logo that help you identify what year your pad was made. Hmm. I have awesome. three Remo practice pads from the pre-tunable era. So like 1958, 59, 60. And each of them is from a different year based on the shape and design of the logo on the head. This episode is brought to you by Dream Symbols. Dream just sent me over five symbols to try out, including the Dark Matter Bliss Paper Thin Crash in 17, 18, and 19 inches, and two Dark Matter Bliss Crash Rides in 20 and 22, and these symbols are awesome. They're dark, they're gritty, they're explosive, and they're just super unique. Beyond how they sound, though, they look like they were buried for a year, dug up, lit on fire, buried, lit on fire again, and then sold to you. They just look so cool, and I highly recommend them. Learn more at dreamsymbols.com and find them on social media at dreamsymbols. I know that the the ability to tension and, you know, having the the, either the tuning keys or the screws around Mm -hmm. was obviously for tuning purposes, but I would assume you could also change out that head if needed, if you completely, because looking back at some of the pictures on the, uh, you know, drum forum here, some of those old uh, pre-Mylar heads, I'm assuming, I mean, some of them looked like, like you said, the internal stuffing, whatever it was, just as you said, turned to dust. So I'm sure you'd probably want to stuff that a little more. Or, or pick a different material. Um, early foam rubber was a disaster and it disintegrated quickly when exposed to the UV rays of sunlight. Yeah. So that's why, you know, the leap from wool batting to early foam rubber was not a successful leap. Yeah. Uh, Improvements in in rubber and foam rubber had to be developed along the way for that stuffing to make sense. By the time I have my Ludwig pad in 1973, and I still have my pad from 1973, by the way. Very nice. The the foam rubber inside is still intact and Mm. still perfectly functional. Wow. But they'd improved things by then. The the whole point at, at... you know, and, and practice pad kits, tunable practice pads yep. took off. Mm-hmm. And again, because you're dealing with copyright law and patent law, whenever you're dealing with protecting intellectual property rights, the law is going to lag behind reality by at least 10 to 20 years. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, absolutely. And so that allowed 
for, well, what percentage of this product do I need to change so I don't violate the previous patent holder's design? And that's why you see Ludwig tunable pads in the 60s that could only be tuned with a drum key. And I mean, those things are monsters. I have a couple of them in my sure. collection and they are beasts, you know. But yes, they were designed to be able to, so you could change the head if you wore it out. It was a brilliant idea. It is brilliant. And this kind of leads me to, so, you know, when I started getting into obviously more of the drum history stuff, particularly into this practice pad stuff about a year ago or whatever do it with that post on drum form, I didn't realize uh, that the kits were so old. So I had, when I was younger, a uh, practice pad kit that I believe I ended up trading when I was younger for like a DW 5000 pedal or something. And, mm -hmm. you know, every I feel like that was more of the modern one that everyone was aware of, that little DW one that had the, you know, pads it kind of just branched off of a stand in the middle. Sure. I did not realize. That's a later model. That's yeah. a later model of practice pad kit. Exactly. And I didn't realize, though, looking at the great photos posted by Mr. Stop Sign 70, uh, there's some just amazing, almost art deco, um, like practice pad kits that look like the Phipps kit, F I P S yes, the yes. Phipps kit, man, that thing is a piece of art. I could put that in the Portland art museum and put a plaque next to it. And people would pay to just come look at it. It's <laughs> exactly. so beautiful. It's so, it's so streamlined. It's so modern for its time. I have never seen one in person. I have never tried playing one. Yeah. I would love to, but, but some of these things, some of these innovations became design they became works of design art. Absolutely. Um, here's another example of, you know, we've had practice pad kits for a long time, since the 50s at least. Another one was Colato, which also became Regal and Regal Tip Sticks. Yeah, sure. So Colato took the tunable practice pad and he tweaked it a little bit and then he turned it over and he added a rubber playing surface on the bottom. Hmm. So that you could flip it and have a choice. Which we see a lot today. There's like a Vic yeah. Firth pad. There's all kinds of pads where you flip them and you get two different yes. feels. Um, and, and on the kit side of things, there's also another great picture that was shared. That's basically a suitcase that opens up and has <sighs> yes. different, uh, you know, there's a little pad on the back of the suitcase. I, I don't know how, I feel like people played softer back then without a doubt. Symbol stands were thinner. Things were just... You know, the Tom arms were thinner. I, th I feel like people well, were rocking yeah, out Yeah, before, so before the Grateful Dead came along, you didn't need two drummers because you didn't have guys yeah. humping their amps with their electric <laughs> guitars to get waves of feedback. Yeah. That, that changed everything, mm -hmm. okay? The Grateful Dead had two drum kits because at some point in their musical adventures, they needed them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you know what's... Moving a little forward now... Sure. Um, what you have between the 60s and the 1980s are two, what I think, and of course, this is my uneducated opinion. I did not grow up in the drum industry. So all of this is based on research, curiosity, and a little bit of, of, of deduction on my part. Between the 60s and the 80s, you had two different things going on. Drum companies were innovating. Drum companies were being bought, sold, merged with each other. You know, yeah. um, and so what you had was a kind of a, a, a multi-decade confusion of, oh my God, here's all this stock that's labeled, you know, it's labeled George Way. What do we do with it now? Well, we relabel it Campco. Exactly. And we just, we, we put these things together and sell them get the heck out of here so we can make room for new stuff that's labeled with our company. So you have a lot of that going on. Um, you see in the catalogs, that there are models of practice pad that were developed in the 50s and they're being held over until 1979 or 1980 Jeez. because they're sitting on backstock in a warehouse somewhere that they have to clear out. Having owned a small retail business, I, I understand that. Yeah. You know, backstock in a warehouse is dead stock until you find a way to sell it and make some money. So you see a bit of a confusion over those, that, those 25 or 30 years of hardware from older models being put onto new drum shells just to move it the heck out of here. Yeah. You always hear about that too, with Ludwig stuff where it was, you know, they, or Slinger, they just reach in and just grab stuff. And oh, that's yeah. what, what makes dating things very difficult, but it just makes sense. Well, and dating practice pads is almost impossible during this time because the, you have the whole WFL Ludwig Leedy con mess 
which, you know, took a full decade to sort out. And in the meantime, people have to work, people have to eat. So they're pulling whatever they can find out of the warehouse, slapping it together. Okay, well, that works here. Just send that out to a dealer somewhere. There's a lot of that going on. But the thing with practice pads is no serial numbers. Practice pads today still don't come with serial numbers as a, as a rule. So dating them is very, very difficult. You have to use you have to use your resources. You have to go to Drum Forum and find knowledgeable people with pads in their collection that they're willing to share photographs of. You have to go to uh, the, 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 the drum catalog. Drum archive, yeah. Uh, archive, the drum archive. Yeah, and that's an amazing resource for anyone who's into drum history because you can just go through catalog and catalog and catalog and take a look at the progression of a product to try and approximate a good guess on its age. I've actually done that with a couple of older drums of mine, but with pads, it's a little harder. But what happens is that for my money, I don't see any, you know, other than a few outliers like Kifa pads in the early 2000s, you know, I don't see any real innovations in practice pad technology until we get into the mid to late 1990s and early 2000s with the rise uh, in popularity of the marching arts, the pageantry arts. Because what happens then is that now we're seeing purpose-specific practice pads. You have your regular practice pads for people who play behind a drum kit. You have practice pads that have brush applications that, you know, I mean, the 10-inch Remo tunable pad, which has still which is still being made today, is a perfectly acceptable surface for a kid to practice their first brush strokes. Sure. If they have nothing else. Yeah. When I was a kid, I practiced on an open copy of the yellow pages and I played <laughs> directly on a page inside the yellow pages. Yeah. To get that and feel, to get a little texture. Just to get a little texture. And I'd set that up on the piano bar at the club where my dad played. And when I would come in to play brushes for him, because my parents were nightclub musicians. I would, he would just grab the yellow pages and slap it open. Here, play this. And I'd pull out my brushes. The song, the robin sings. He'd hold the microphone for me, play one, wow. play one handed chords. And I'd sit there and sing along and play for myself. It was, it was, it was a nice parlor trick, but it was also what I had available. Well, that's the beauty of drums is you can do that. And there's a, there's one of Steve Gadd's old tapes where he's, Someone is sitting there, I believe, holding a like a two inch um, like tape box, you know, like a master reel, and he's playing brushes on it. And it's it's kind of funny because like he plays for like three minutes and this guy's holding this box and you're probably thinking yeah. like the guy's probably like, OK, can I put down the box now? <laughs> no, but in the meantime, it's Steve Gadd. So it's he's Steve making Gadd. art. Exactly. And you don't want him to stop. No. Right. Yes. OK, it's a beautiful yeah. thing. So we're now we're in, we're, we're going to fast forward a little bit because out of interests of time. Sure. Now we're in the early 2000s and now a lot of new innovations are happening. First, you have new approaches to making rubber compounds, which can be fine tuned so that now you can make very specific recipes to get different hardnesses, different levels of response on a rubber practice pad. That's a big innovation right there because when you can fine tune something, that's going to open the door to a purpose driven pad. Yeah. Hmm. Two, you have the rise in popularity of the marching arts because in the late 90s, early 2000s, Drum Corps finds its marketing gold and suddenly all these kids go, oh, that's cool. I want to do that. Right. Yeah. And so suddenly you have a market that you've been growing that is now clamoring for these kinds of pads in what is it? Uh, 2004, 2005, you have the guy who would go to go on to found Zymox. But in the beginning, before he founded Zymox percussion, he had patented a design so that you had a rubber pad on top and underneath in carved into the wood, you had a recess where you could put metal ball bearings, cover it with a metal panel, adjust the tightness of the screws just so, so that the balls would rattle a little bit. And suddenly uh, you had a practice pad with fake snare drum sound and the fake snare drum yeah. sound was just tight enough to approximate the sound of a highly tensioned early Kevlar headed marching snare. Yeah. And the kids went nuts and as he was beginning to grow this you know zymox percussion 
he was also licensing this patent to other drone companies and they would brand it Promark ahead. Oh my gosh, who else? Yamaha. They were all taking this same design and the pat, the licensing, the patent sticker is on the metal band on the bottom of the, of the pad. Hmm. And it would say, Oh, you know, patented patent number, blah, 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 blah. And you turn it over and it would just be whatever brand had hired his company to make the pads and brand them for them. Mm, that's so and we're cool. going to see more and more of this as these pers- purpose specific pads take off. But that was a real innovation that was of its time. Yeah. And, and now it's happening all the time where you think of a pad that like that, that has that little bit of a sound and it's kind of like a, Oh, duh. Why not just throw it on there? And you know, it, it seems like uh seems like a no brainer, but nothing is a no brainer until someone, d- someone does it. And then that's it's right. Like, that's oh, right. Now we all do it. <laughs> And so there was a quote on the Drum Forum site that I went and found, which really, oh, it really speaks to me. And and it was Deaf Moon on the Drum Forum site. Okay, yeah. Here's the quote. Drum practice pads began on a padded chair, went through cardboard boxes, and then to a piece of plumber's rubber nailed to a board. How we got to someone charging $159 for a rimmed space age material screwed onto a plastic body is beyond my understanding. Hmm. And yeah, okay. He's talking like a professional curmudgeon, but he has a point. (laughs) (laughs) He has a point. Yeah. Um, What's really interesting about my interest in pads is that I'm also a longtime advocate and practitioner of sustainable living Um, because my industry was the bicycle industry I, I've, I lived for 35 years without owning a car. I rode a bike everywhere. I didn't uh, need a car in Portland. We had bikes. Sure, we have great public transit. And I got really tuned into the idea of making a life more sustainable. My interest in practice pads runs counter to that philosophy yeah. because, because now there's a practice pad. Oh, wait, I need to be able to play these rudiments on a pad but on Thursday. So now I need a pad for Thursdays with these rudiments. And, Mm. you know, somebody is going to go there. Okay. Somebody is going to go there and it's going to go from the ridiculous to the sublime. I recently acquired for my collection. um, I'm going to reach back just a little bit. Sure. HQ real feel pads, those late nineties pads with the tan gum rubber and marching drummers of a certain age that grew up on these pads. They're all, oh, I'm so sorry I sold that. I want to get that pad again. And and suddenly it's like the hot used pad item on eBay. You know, people are paying like 70, 80, 90 bucks for a used HQ tan gum rubber pad. It's like, really? <laughs> I recently found one that I'm sure had to have been a trade show gimme. It's it's three inches across. <laughs> it's adorable. It can be played. The tiny pads. That's that's it's a, bit, a little that's a modern pad. Thing now, and I you mean. know what? Yeah. It sounds good. It sounds great. It feels great. You put it on a rubber surface, it's not gonna creep a whole lot. Sure. Um but it's you know, now you know, we're blowing up the sustainability idea right and left in practice pad manufacture. Because mm. How many different rubber pads does a person need? That's now you have point. people on drum discussion groups going, is there a meaningful difference between the yellow Vader pad and the red Vader pad in yeah. feel? And, and maybe I should have both. And, and, and people, people have gotten as fussy about modern practice pads as they have been about drums and heads for decades. Yeah. But you get it as an enthusiast. I mean, you obviously I get do. the... And, but that's a good point because rubber does not, I mean, rubber is coming from places where it's usually not, I mean, you got to be careful. Uh, You know, you know what I mean? It's, 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 rubber is not an easily renewable resource. No, exactly. And, um, you're, it's great. You mentioned that, uh, because I never thought about that. I am just usually an idiot and don't think about where things actually come from, but, Mm, um, yeah, but that's smart. So I want to, Take a step back here and ask you about a couple particular pads that I'm seeing. Well, first, I want to mention that. So I've talked about it on the show before, but my grandpa was a drummer. And um, in the fi- I posted a picture on that forum. On, on the, I the, saw that the photo. 50s, oh, that's so sweet. And he's, he's sitting on the side of his bed. He's smoking a pipe um, and he's practicing. But I guarantee and I think he told me when I was younger, I guarantee he just took a saw and just cut out a piece of wood and then like oh, yeah. some, you know, 
leather or rubber or whatever on it yep. and g- glued it down. And, and uh, he would also talk about cutting up newspaper and putting that in his bass drum and just all those old school sure. techniques. But I just want to give pads. Yeah. Homemade pads. Cause then it's like, it, it was different. It's post-war. I mean, obviously, which was kind of, I guess, a boom in the fifties, but uh, I think that was around 56 or 57. Um, so shout out to my grandpa, Tom Connup, who's no longer with us, but was a big influence. But a couple things here. So looking back at the um, drum forum thread, the Gladstone, the Billy Gladstone mm. kind of vacuum drum pad that sits on the middle of your snare yeah. and converts your snare. We want to talk about that a little bit. I mean, that, that everyone has used one of those at some point in their life. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Um, I think if that's what you grew up with, then you thought it was great because <laughs> that's what you had access to. Yeah. I think that it, I mean, if you play on the thin part of that pad, yeah. you get a snare sound that's a little muted, makes your mom happier. Um, I think that's not an optimal pad for developing great drum technique. I think it's an optimal pad for making your drum quieter. Exactly. And sometimes you have to make choices, as we say for, with my people, for the sake of peace. Billy Gladstone was a nice Jewish boy who understood that sometimes you have to make choices for the sake of peace. <laughs> and he probably developed that pad to make mothers happy. That's funny. That's a good way to look at it. I get Billy Gladstone. I completely get him and love him <laughs> and love his contributions to drumming. Absolutely. Yeah. And I get it. Okay. But yeah. homemade pads are still a thing. Yeah. Um. You can still make your own practice pad out of scrap wood. And whether or not you want to put a tilt on it is up to you. I have, I, I sent you a photo of two homemade pads that I love. Yes. One of them is covered with stickers and it, I made it from scrap wood and a, a cast off piece of gum rubber from some industrial application. It's my very first homemade pad. I've had it for a number of years and I still take it with me. What I didn't show you is that the bottom is covered with mouse pad or stack cup stacking game material with the rubber side out and the fabric side glued to the wood. And so now you have a pad with a non-skid surface and cool. And it feels wonderful. It sounds wonderful. And it at a, at nine inches square or 10 inches square, it's, it's carry on. It yeah. fits in my carry on bag and it's, the, it's a pad I take with me places when I have to be quiet. The other yeah. pad is one that I actually just made last week. Um, Rima Tip Top are the manufacturers in Germany of the most familiar tire patch, tube patches in bicycling. Hmm. Everybody has a Rima patch, a Rima patch kit in their cycling bag. They make, they make patches for inner tubes of all sizes, including tractor tubes. And I have a new old stock box of 10 of these things that are, each of the patches is like four and a half inches in diameter. And, you know, they're four and a half inches across. It's a big round giant Rima patch. And I glued a couple of these, one on top of the other, on another piece of scrap wood. And you know what? Oh, yeah. And it feels great. Yeah, um, absolutely. And and again, I took some mouse pad material and put a non-skid surface on the bottom. That non-skid surface also insulates if you're trying to protect a tabletop. So far, I have not added a tilt to either of these, um, but I could. Yeah. I think I think that if you want to add an element of experience to the drumming that you are learning to do, it's a great thing to make your own pad. I was just going to say that you're 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 invested in it. It feels it's like, like I am currently totally unrelated to drums, but I am currently staining some pine closet doors for Mm. my two year old's room. And I'm putting three coats on each one. I'm doing poly. I had to use pre-stain. I feel a connection to these closet doors that I'll always (laughs) (laughs) always have, but you know, it's a beautiful, you know why it's a beautiful thing, Bart, because it's a throwback to the time when Americans knew how to fix the things they owned. Exactly. And anything that you and I can do today to bring us back into that space is good for us and it's good for our community. And it saves money, which you don't well, need sure. to go out. Yes. And, and, you know, you can you can buy a $150 pad, a $100, $60 pad, but you can also just make it 
Um, and on the um, Rima tip top um, uh, patches, I just want to say on that, you know, give a shout out Lane Bune and then Lee Van Keefe, which is a good Lee Van Cleef, the actor reference. Um, <laughs> Both had a back and forth talking about that on the thread. And it's just so cool to see that where he said, uh, I have this pad. It's homemade. And then Lee Van Keefe got on and said, this is what it is. It's this old uh, yes. you know, patch. So that inspired cool. me to make my own. Oh, that's so cool. I love that inspired that. me. And I went, oh, he's right. This is a great material to play on. <laughs> this is great. It's the community. Um it now, is. Let me ask you, uh, I think one last bit here that I want to mention is there's some pictures that were shared uh, on our with our drum forum friends here mm -hmm. that well, two more. So uh, going back to stop sign 70, who shared a couple pictures of something that I've seen more modern, more modernly, but uh, it's the pad that looks like it can strap onto your leg, which oh, sure. I'm I'm seeing very old versions of those with with what appear to be calf skin heads and then it gets yes. newer i didn't know that one, went back that far uh one of the earliest versions of that that i saw came from france and it's from the 19 teens cool it and it was sense. it was a homemade pad nice yeah because if i can if i'm gonna play on my leg why should it hurt i'll put a pad there <laughs> yeah it's like ingenuity it's just like the okay like exactly like well my legs are really getting red well, I wonder if I put something there, boom, idea. <laughs> <laughs> why, why not? I have to say that one of the things I love about being a drummer in terms of being part of the tribe, the tribe of drum is that I can tell you that this kind of homegrown innovation probably doesn't happen to the same extent in the tribe of bassoon, for example. <laughs> sure. You know what I'm saying? Oh, totally. Drumming is so hands-on. It's so primal. The response, the rewards for drumming are so immediate. You hit something with a stick and you get a sound. <gasps> Mom, that's so cool. I want to yeah. do that. How many kids are doing that with a double reed instrument? I do not know. But but because it's the the the, the connection between player and instrument is so primal and so direct, I think it opens the door to a lot of grassroots innovation. And that is a big part of what I love about being a drummer. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the last one that I just think is a neat one that I'm, I'm just trying to hit on the ones that everyone that I'm seeing pictures of that I think everyone has seen in their life is the uh, the dude posted one saying um, in 1966, he used it's basically like the the kind of keystone looking badge where it's just a it's just a big hunk of rubber. Oh, I yeah. believe it says Porto practice pad. Um, and there's just that big chunk of rubber cut into that kind of keystone shape. Mm -hmm. Those were just uh, the, they must have caught on with schools. Um, well, they did. They were they're ubiquitous. First of all, you can still find them everywhere. I think they're like bunnies and they breed. Um, <laughs> yeah. They came about in the 50s after rubber compounds started getting messed around with and improved for durability. Yeah. Uh, the, the, they're really great for kids because you can just stick it in your pocket. It's yeah, literally exactly. a pocket pad. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's, the, and, and if, if, if they've lived in a climate where the climate didn't destroy the, the rubber compound, they're still great. I have one. I take it places. It still works. Yeah. They're absolutely. terrific. Some yeah. of the coolest pads are the ones that were mass produced to the point of being ubiquitous. Yeah. For sure. They're popular for a reason. I mean, they're mm -hmm. they caught on and I just have to read it. And, you know, it's funny. I'm sure he he wrote it. So it's worth, you know, it's, it's out in the world. But he wrote, uh, I could shove this pad uh, in the pocket door to my bedroom and my parents couldn't open it while I smoked from my bong and ex exhaled it through a short <gasps> garden hose. I hung out. Oh, the window. yeah. I remember reading that and <laughs> so laughing like, out loud. That is too funny. Thank you. See, the dude. <laughs> we're drummers. We are natural innovators. Yes. We will come up with solutions to things people haven't thought about yet. Exactly. That's genius. So, <laughs> um, well, Beth, I want to um, just like first off, just thank you. And we'll talk about, we're going to do a little bonus ep episode, which we'll talk about in a minute, but I want to go ahead and just thank everyone on the um, forum real quick. Vintage drummer, Sweden, the dude, uh, stop sign 70. Don't forget deaf moon, deaf moon. Yes. Deaf moon. And then Bethness. That's you. I'm just seeing you. Yeah. Right there. Lane, yeah. Bune, noble, Cooley nut, uh, no Libos. Dave Ziedel. Thank you, Dave Ziedel. Um, Def Moon, JDA, 
Frank Godiva, Elrod1707, Matched Gripper, GKRK, hmm. Pedal Pusher, Drummer Friend, uh, who's a fan of the show. CSR had some great pictures. Uh, Malt JD and Lee Van Keefe. And I believe that is it. So thank you to those people for submitting those. And it took about a year to get this together, but uh, we found the right person with Beth. Um, anything you want to plug now at the end for people to check out that you're working on? Oh my gosh. Well, I have two musical hats that I wear. One is as a drummer, percussionist, uh, historian. The other is as a uh, an acoustic folk pop singer, songwriter. And if you'd like, I will send you the links to both of those places Please when do. we are done. So you can include them yep. at, uh, when you post this interview. Yes. Um, uh, I, I, I do singer songwriter stuff under my name, Beth Hammond music. And I do drum stuff under the blog, uh, the blog spot blog drum love one word. Cool. Awesome. Well, um, for everyone listening, uh, Beth is going to hang out here for a little bit and we're going to do a quick episode and Beth doesn't know what I'm going to ask her, but I'm going to say now. So Beth, what I want to talk about with you is maybe a couple stories about how you've gone about, uh, acquiring Oh, I knew, down some I of these, knew that was coming. Yeah, yes. Some of these we're going to we're going to pull back the curtain and and destroy the magic. Let's do it. <laughs> cool. So, we'll wrap up here and then we'll jump over to that, but for everyone who wants to check out those um bonus episodes, go to drumhistorypodcast.com, click the Patreon link, 2 bucks a month and up if you want early episodes and all that. It's a little more, but um then you get the bonus episodes. So, on that note, um, oh, and we should tell people to join your awesome Facebook group. So why don't yes, you tell them about that? There is quick. a Facebook group for people who are super into drum cads. It's called the Drum Pad History Group. It is co-moderated by myself and Mark Beecher. And if you want to join, you do have to answer the two screening questions. One is to tell us a little about yourself as a drummer. The other is to agree to our very simple and very basic rules. You must answer both of those questions to be admitted to the group. Thanks so much, Bart, for having me on your show. This oh, has yeah. been a surprising and wonderful delight. Yes, you you are great. You're the perfect guest for this. A very nice and sweet person. And, and shout out to Mark Beecher, who's been on the show and who made me an honorary member of... Uh, N-A-R-D. I'm just super proud of that still. Um, I don't think I could. I have the. I, I got to work on my chops more to actually, <laughs> you know, follow up with it. But um, thank you to Mark uh, for being a member of that group and running it with you. So, Beth, on that note, thanks for being here. This has been a blast. Thank you for having me, Bart. Take good care. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning.